Welcome to the Heartbeat for Hire podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Dowd. My goal is to help train leaders and sales organizations how to manage and deliver results with empathy, compassion, and kindness. Let's get started. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Heartbeat for Hire. If you are looking for a dose of sunshine, do I have a treat for you? My guest is Siri Lindley, and Siri is a two-time world champion triathlete, winner of 12 ITU World Cup races, an inspirational, energetic life coach, I can vouch for that, and one of Tony Robbins' 10 favorite motivational speakers. She's got an infectious and authentic passion. She empowers audiences to drive for peak performance and to do work and ultimately conquer the demons of fear and self-doubt. In the late, in late 2019, Siri faced her most difficult battle yet when she was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Despite given a less than 10% chance of survival at the time of her diagnosis, she was pronounced cancer-free by her doctors in May of 2020. Um, Siri also has launched two coaching programs, the Serious Squad and the Seriously Authentic Squad, which we are going to talk about. She also has co-founded with her wife, Beck, her two nonprofits, Believe Ranch and Rescue and Horses in Our Hands. We're going to talk about that too. She is a Hall of Famer, a Hall of Famer for Brown and Boulder, Colorado, which I went to school at. And there's so much more I could just keep going on and on, but I want to get into the good stuff, Siri. So welcome. Well, well, Lindsay, thank you for that amazing introduction. It makes me super nervous because now I just <laughs> want to make sure that I don't fall short of all those great things. Possible. It's impossible. I so, am thrilled. Oh, good. Well, this is every like I said, everyone's in for a treat. So you have an incredible story, and I'd love you to just kind of take us back. What attracted you to triathlons in the first place? Let's just start there. Well, it was a very odd choice for me because throughout the first 20 years of my life, I had been a team sports player. I played field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse all through high school and at Brown University. But in my last year of college, I discovered that I was gay. And this was at a time when on the outside, it looked like I had it made. You know, I'm going to this great school. I'm getting good grades, I'm a three-sport varsity athlete, but on the inside, I was slowly dying. Mm. I was, and I'm sure there are people out here that can relate, but I was just riddled with anxiety. I was suffocated by my fears, yet on the outside, I was pretending that everything was okay. And I had developed uh, this ridiculous case of OCD. Now, some of you may think OCD is good. It keeps you, you know, on track. No, this was like flicking lights on and off for 45 minutes straight Mm. till I could get a horrible thought out of my mind. Like I felt like an absolute crazy person. Yeah. And nobody spoke about anxiety in those days. Nobody spoke about fear. Nobody spoke about self-doubt. So I thought I was the only person on the planet that Mm. felt this way. And... That's when actually my greatest mentor, Tony Robbins, I started reading his first book and he had cassette tapes. And I finally, for the first time, understood that the only person that can change my experience of life is me. I'm sitting there waiting for something to happen to change it. But what it came down to is what I was focusing on, the meaning I was giving everything that was happening, and what I chose to do about it, which was these behaviors. And when I realized, and and this is just a simple, simple for everyone, I know you know this, Lindsay, but at that time, all I was focusing on was what was missing, what was wrong, what I feared, what I didn't want to have happen, and what I had no control over. Other people, what they do, how they respond, how they react. And what I needed to do was change a channel to focusing on what I had, what I loved, what I wanted to create, and what I had all the control over which was my own experience of life in every moment. And it was that shift. And it, it took conditioning. It took, you know, disciplining myself. But that is what freed me from the OCD and freed me from the cycle of, like, not even knowing who I was. So long story short, when I found out I was gay, that was kind of, a, you know, great. <laughs> 
Now I got to deal with this, but I thought back to the pile. <laughs> back to the pile, but at least I discovered something about me, and yeah. everything was kind of okay until my hero, my father, called me and said that you know somebody told me you're gay, Siri. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly have a daughter that's gay. I beg you, tell me that this isn't true. Yeah. And you know, I had to. I was choosing my father or me for the rest of my life. And I said, dad, like I'm the same me, just please just love me anyway. And he hung up the phone and I didn't hear from him for the next two years, basically uh. for the next 25 years, except sometimes on Christmas. But it was in that moment that, you know, I had to make a decision between living the story that he was telling me that was because you're gay, you're unlovable, you're worthless. I don't wanna have you in my life. You're never gonna be happy. You're only gonna get hurt. But I was not willing to live that story. This is who I am. No. No. So I had to shift the story and say, being gay is gonna be my superpower somehow because if I live fearlessly authentic, if I just bring all of me into this life, I'll be able to do great things. Yeah. Did I believe it in that moment? No, but you know, I couldn't afford to live the story he was telling me. So I had to become the person that believed that being me would be my superpower. And literally it was like the next weekend, I went and watched a triathlon. And I was so in awe of these people, like all ages, sizes, abilities. And I thought, my God, this will be how I find me because I felt like I was now on a desperate mission to prove to myself, most importantly, that even as a gay woman, I can achieve spectacular things. I can yeah. inspire, I can make a difference in people's lives. And, and most importantly, that, that I could be loved mm. by myself. And that was gonna take some work. And so mm. by taking on, you know, I came in dead last in my first triathlon. I didn't know how to swim when I decided that I was oh gonna- Oh my God. And came in dead last, but that's what was going to make it such a powerful journey. And I knew that through that never giving up and never giving in and never stopping believing in me that at the end of that road, wherever it led me, I would be able to respect myself. I would be able to believe in me and I would develop a love for me. And that's all I wanted. God, a long that, story, but like, I oh, mean, that's kind of please, how. that was beautiful. And I, I just give you so much credit for facing that fear head on and for just redefining your, your life. And by making that choice and changing that channel, you, you tuned out all of the rest of the noise and said, nope, this is my lane. This is where I'm going. And I know for me, I'm no triathlete. I have run a marathon. I will never do another wow. one, but no, no, it, it was a bucket list. I did it. I'm done. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that when I exercise, I get out of my head. And that I think is a gift of, of exercise because, you know, you can put a lot of demons in there and, and just really wreck your course. So I imagine that really kind of helped you channel what was important and where you needed to focus. Absolutely. It was therapy. And it just was something like working out. It's a meaning you give it, isn't it? Like if it's yeah. something you have to do and it's painful, you're not going to do it. But for me, it was almost a matter of life or death for me. And it was something that made me feel proud and made me feel strong and gave me energy. And when I figured that out, it's like, this has to be my pathway. That's so, amazing. but everyone has the ability. Started. Sorry, you, go ahead. No, so you started and how long until you became a world champion? Well, first, let me say, I embarrassed myself often. <laughs> I was, hum it's funny though, the embarrassment came later. Like my first race, you know, I got in a lane that was way too fast for me and people were yelling at me because I didn't know how to swim. Oh punching me and hitting me oh. the bike. I just was like, I looked like a maniac. And then on the run, you know, I ran the whole 5k with my helmet on without knowing it. And, but it's 
that day, I'd never felt so alive in my entire life. Like to me, I was doing, I was backing myself, doing something that scared me to death. But it was at night. And I think you, I'm sure everyone out there can relate to this. I got in bed and that's when you get all vulnerable and you remember the looks on people's faces. Yes. And you remember the things that they said about you. And suddenly I'm hearing, you know, people saying, oh my God, how embarrassing. Oh, she's such a disaster. Why is she doing this? Why does she have her helmet on? And I just started crying. Not like a why me, I'm never going to do that again. Mm-hmm. But crying because I was like, I must. I am going to be the best in the world in this sport is what I decided in my heart. So it's how do you use that? How do you respond to that kind of humiliation? How do you respond to failure? Because the big thing for me is I needed to become someone willing to fail. Because in order for me to succeed, I had to fail over and over again many, many times. Yeah. So... I had to remind myself that it's when we fail, that's when we learn the most, you know? Yeah. And honoring that failure, like taking the lesson and not repeating it and saying, yeah, I fell down, but how did I get back up? And it's the getting back up that the people love. And when they, you never wrote, you never ran with your helmet on again, right? Never did. You learn those, those disappointments you learn the most from that's how you make the most progress and that's why like if you're not willing to fail you're not willing to succeed because you won't Mm -hmm. so for me it became i'm either winning which wasn't winning winning was just making progress or i'm learning Mm -hmm. there was no failing there was no losing it's either i'm winning making progress getting better than i was the day before or i'm learning and thank god for that because I think I would have given up a lot sooner if I didn't have that perspective. But it took me eight years. And, you know, there was one moment, uh, I made it to the Olympic trials, actually, this is six years later, and, and there's a whole kind of success formula that I used, like we all use. Yeah. You know, you want to achieve something, you immerse yourself. Yeah. You become obsessed with it. You learn everything that you can learn. You model the the people that do what you want to do at the highest levels. And so for six years, I was doing that. And I actually made it to the Olympic trials. But I had gone, this was the be all end all for me. And I had visualized for 365 nights, the perfect race. Mm-hmm. From the gun going off, everything going perfectly, cross the line, Siri Lindley makes the Olympic team. Big mistake in that first. (laughs) Anyways, on that day, I dive in, and within the first 30 seconds, I get elbowed in the face, dunked under the water, and I lose the front pack. I had not visualized that. Nope. And because I hadn't even anticipated something not going perfectly, Um. I was swimming as hard as I could going backwards. Got on my bike, pushing harder than I ever have going backwards. I was choking and I quit. I quit at the Olympic trials, my be all end all race. Couple things, first of all, I knew that people were gonna come up and say, Siri, what happened? Are you injured? Are you sick? Did you have a mechanical? And I knew that if I came up with an excuse, that would be the end of my career. Yeah, because I would cease growing. Cease well, it gave growth. you permission to quit if you had an excuse. That's right, exactly. So the first person that came up, I said, I choked. I had visualized a perfect race, hadn't anticipated anything going wrong, and when it did, I had no response. But I fell into the deepest, darkest depression. And because it had become the be all end all. But here's the thing. One day I thought, you know, what happened way back when in college, when I was about to take my own life because of my anxiety and my depression, what did I shift? And I remembered I shifted what I was focusing on. I shifted the meaning that I gave things. So I suddenly just entertained, like, why am I not doing that now? So I sat there and I thought, my God, six years ago, I didn't even know how to swim. Instead of focusing on how far I have to go to achieve this dream, 
look at how far I've come. I mean, it's and incredible. I, just, I suddenly was just like so grateful. And I, I mean, Siri, I, I gotta say like your ability to recognize how you need to modify your own behavior and your own thinking is such an incredible gift. And so many people don't have it. You know, they, they blame others. They, it's circumstances. It's, you know, just like you said, the excuses, well, you know, I, it was mechanical. I mean, it, you can make excuses till the cows come home, but you were willing to be vulnerable. You owned it. And not only that, you figured out, nope, if I'm going to do this, I got to do it a different way. And you just understand the pivot. I think that's brilliant. I'm just so impressed. Well, well, thank you so much for that. And I believe we all have that inside of us. I mean, think about the discipline that each and every one of you brings to your day. Maybe yeah. you have kids, you wake up, you feed the kids, you do your workout, you go to work, you show up at all these meetings. You have tremendous discipline. All it takes is you turning that discipline into your mindset. What are you focused on? The meaning you're giving things and not letting yourself sit. Like, so I say I fell into that deep, dark depression. That was for like a day, maybe two <laughs> days because I don't want to suffer. Yeah. And I think once I change the way that I look at, change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Suddenly I felt this intense gratitude. And then I started thinking, well, what did I learn about this? Well, number one, going into something important, I'm not gonna imagine everything going perfect. Like I'm going to see things going wrong and see myself gracefully and confidently and calmly overcoming them and pivoting, finding a different way of doing it. And I also thought, you know, somewhere along the line here, I forgot about why I was doing this in the first place. Suddenly somewhere in like three or four years, I started thinking that it was all about sponsors and making money and making teams. Yeah. When that's you lost not the focus. Idea. Yeah. I lost focus of my why. Yeah. And that was so powerful because that was not bringing out the best of me. When you lose touch with why you're doing this in the first place, that's when you suddenly start plateauing or you start yeah. like not performing to your ability. And so I reconnected to, oh my God, like I'm here because I want to find a love for myself. Mm. I want to find respect for myself. I want to build up my trust in me. And when I changed the way I was looking at it, I realized that, yes, I had done that. I <laughs> failed so often, but I got up every single time. You know, I never gave in. I never gave up. Oh, God, so, so inspiring. But we all can do that, right, Lindsay? Like, yeah, I, it, it's changing your mindset to what is purposeful and what is going to help you define your why, support your why and, and follow it. It's, it, yeah, it's such a clear example. It's incredible. So, okay, so you make it to be a world champion in eight years, yeah? Yes. Okay, amazing, congratulations. Uh, and then okay. at some point you decide, I wanna coach. Yes. Tell me about that transition. Well, so after the Olympic trials, I thought of another thing, you know, what can I change? How can I do things differently? And I thought about how powerful proximity is. And I thought, imagine if I surrounded myself with people that just were so much better than me. And there was one coach that was only coaching world champions, Olympic medalists. And I thought, I'm going to get this guy to coach me. And when I went up and met him, he actually looked at me and he said, I actually remember you. You were at a World Cup race in Australia. I was walking home. All my athletes had finished. They won the race, filled the podium. But you were in like 30th place. Yeah. But you were absolutely killing yourself to come in 29th. And he said, I like that. That's hunger. And so he took me on. And I went to uh. Switzerland. And I was the worst athlete in the squad. I got my butt kicked to oblivion. But my philosophy now, you want to get good at something, surround yourself with people that are better than you because Always. your rise is so much quicker than if you're surrounded by people that you're better than. So mm -hmm. invite that, whether you want to call it competition or challenge, whatever it is. Yeah. 
And the way he trained me, it was just insane. Like, it didn't make sense. I would cry every single day. It was like eight hours a day. It was like harder than anything I'd ever done in my life. But what it taught me, even though it made no sense, is that, you know, there was one day I couldn't walk and I said, Brett, I can't, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I can't even move. And all he said was, find a way. And... I thought about it and I thought, all I can do is the best, all I can do in any given moment is the best that I can and try and find a way. And what was so brilliant about this, it sounds cruel, especially if I told you what the training looked like, it sounds cruel, but it was brilliant because every day he was giving me something that seemed impossible. Every day I just did the best that I could with what I had and tried to find a way. And every day I proved to myself that what seems impossible is really possible. Because how can you ever know what you're truly capable of if you're not trying to do what you don't think you can every single day? Well, and that's such a metaphor for life and for business too. When you think about it, there are so many leaders that focus on what we can't do. And when you, you don't often hear the words, find a way with kindness, you hear it delivered and well, figure it out or get there. I don't care how you do it, but get there. And it's not from the same spirit of find a way because I know you can do this. It's a completely different frame. But yeah, that's, that's some brilliant coaching right there. But can we not, even in those moments where they say, figure it out, and we don't feel the heart, can we not receive it and put some heart into that? Well, we have to. We have to. And I mean, yes. if you, if you want to enjoy your life, you right. have to do it. Yeah. Otherwise everything is, it's just a job. It's just a task. It's, it's, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I have to do this. And that's not very fulfilling. Cause when you get to do it instead, that's what brings out the best in you. So I trained like this for two years and my body was just, well, actually when I won the world championship, the first year working with him, I crossed the line. I was ready to retire. I found what I was looking for. Like I did I'm it. done and I'm <laughs> ready to retire. But then I thought about it in my mind and I thought my voice up there can be really critical. And maybe a week down the road, she's going to say, maybe you just got lucky. Maybe it was a fluke. You know how we do that? Yep. We all do that. And I was not willing to make all those eight years that had led to this point, I was not willing to have that get in the way. So I vowed that I was gonna put together one more year. It was brutal, cause I was mm-hmm. done really, but I was able to maintain the number one in the world ranking and I retired at number one, but all I wanted to do was to coach. All I wanted to do was to say, hey, look at what you learned. Like, don't yeah. worry, like you can do it. Like, let's do this. Like I was able, I was now living proof of what's possible for anyone. And that was it. The story that you lived is such a testament to the possible. And just like Brett said to you, find a way, you were able to give that to others. And that just makes so much sense. So you're coaching, you, where, where in the life history does the cancer come in? (sighs) Um, well, I'd been coaching for a long, long time, was able to coach athletes to 11 world championship crowns and different things. And it, I have to say, when you help someone else get there, it's even more powerful. I know. You know that because you're doing this every single day, Lindsay. Yeah, I love it. And it was just two and a half years ago. Life is everything I had been working so hard to create my entire life, a life with internal freedom, calm, confidence, a life of mission and purpose, having Mm -hmm. love of my life and everything is just perfect. And then the phone call comes and When my doctor started speaking, my wife is standing next to me. My doctor is saying, you have acute myeloid leukemia and you've got this genetic mutation Mm -hmm. that's going to make this really, 
difficult to treat. And in his voice, my wife is wailing, screaming at the top of her lungs, tears coming down her face. And I'm sitting there and I'm hearing the tone of his voice. I'm watching. Out of, yeah, out everything of body. Yeah. Everything I'm hearing is, this is the end. And it's another moment where God. I'm not willing to live that story. No, not like, no. No. And so I declared even though in this moment I'm devastated, I'm terrified, I'm like falling to pieces, but somehow I found the words to say, this is not my time to go. I'm going to survive and I am going to thrive, period. And they both mm -hmm. just kind of, but it was in that moment of decision. Again, did I believe that I was? No, I'm terrified, but I had to become that person that was going to survive and that was mm -hmm. going to thrive. And the thing is that when we choose a new story that we want to live, in order to make that happen, we have to become that person. We have to keep yeah. in that story. But all I did in every moment, okay, well, what would Siri, what would that future me do in this moment? Mm -hmm. Well, she would leave no stone unturned. She's going to choose the treatment that she believes in with all her heart. She's going to go do all these extra things. She's going to need leave no stone unturned. She's going to sweep out her soul and forgive and mm. let go of all the disease. And so what it does when you, when you decide which story you do want to live, even if you don't feel mm. like that's you yet, you role play that story. You do what that person would do. Yeah. And you know, it's an absolute miracle that I'm here, Lindsay. It's just, I, I, I remember this woman on social media wrote me and cause I had been documenting my journey even on the darkest days. And she said, how can you be so positive? Mm -hmm. You know, your chances of survival are less than 10%. They were actually like 5%. And at first I felt so hurt that she would write that to me, but you know what it did? It was such a gift. It connected me to who I am. It, it connected me to my yeah. proof that the impossible is really possible. And I wrote her back and I said, I am not a statistic. I am Siri Lindley. And I've proven that the impossible is really possible and I am going to do that again now. And here's the thing, none of us are statistics. None of us, no one can tell you what's possible for you. No one can tell you what you're capable of. That's up to you. I, I just love when you just said you choose the story you're going to live. Yes. And, and I think that's so powerful and it's such a great narrative to live by. And that person that sent you that message probably does not know they have the ability to be positive at the worst times in their life. Yes. And it's, it's a sadness for them and not a reflection of you, you already made the determination this was not gonna get the best of you. And what an example for us all. I mean, it's it's brilliant. And this is the beginning of the pandemic you're going through treatment, right? It was 2020. Ugh. My transplant was on February 20th, 2020. Um, but I have a couple, because what you just said I think is so very important you know, you get to choose whether your life is going to be tragic or a masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, your life can be full of struggle and full sure. of failure, but a masterpiece. You get to choose to be a victim or a victor. Mm -hmm. Like that's up to you. And it's never too late to change that story. So true. You can change it today. But the other thing that I think really saved me, which I think is something I just really want to share is, you know, there were times when I was in that hospital and I am just so sick and so weak and so terrified and hanging by a thread. But I would catch myself and I would say, Siri, focusing on how sick you feel, how weak you are, how terrified you are, that is not going to get you. Well. Serve you. Mm -hmm. That is not going to save your life. So I would change the channel to gratitude. Yes. A moment of your darkest times, your times full of despair, you can go to gratitude. And I looked over at my mom who had slept on the couch for 30 plus nights. 
Mm. I thought about my doctors that were like so trying so hard to save my life. My wife who never left my side, the umbilical cord donor and my sister who gave oh me God. Life. And I would feel so grateful. And when I focused on what I had and what was good and what was right, I suddenly had more energy. I suddenly sure. had more hope. Well, it's changing that focus again. I mean, it's, you, you've done this, you've repeated it, right? You know how to get yourself out of these deep, dark moments to see the light and to, to see the possible. And not many people know how to do that. And you're teaching us all today. So this is so, so amazing. Write this down. Gratitude is the bridge from despair to hope. Sure. You want to participate in your own rescue love that move to gratitude like it's just um it's safe it I, a lot of things saved my life but that, oh, having gosh. that saved my life so i mean as everyone has heard you live with incredible intention and purpose and one of your loves is horses so i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about that because i know this is a massive passion project of yours and you've got two nonprofits that support horses. So tell us, what, what is it about? What's the mission behind it? First of all, I, I, this was not in my plans. Um, six years ago, I rescued a horse. This is before I got sick. And you can see her over my shoulder yeah. here, Savannah. She came into my life and she, she changed me. One of the first things she showed me is like these horses, 60,000 horses a year are slaughtered for human consumption. And it is the most barbaric six, seven minutes dismembered alive. It's brutal. It's horrible. It's the worst thing you could ever even think about. But the thing is, they've been on that road where they have been badly treated. Some of them tortured, some of them neglected, starved. She came to us pretty much, you know, she had been taken up by another rescue and I didn't know what I was rescuing her from at that point in time. But she changed my life in a matter of weeks. And these horses that come in like Savannah, after about a week of consistent love, showing up, feeding them, giving them the medical care they need, being kind and loving and compassionate, within a week, they forgive humans. Wow. And it made me think, we don't do that. No. Someone hurts up us, we hold on to it for a lifetime. Oh my and God. guess what? When we blame them for everything we don't have in our lives, the great success we dreamed of, the loving relationship we dreamed of, when we blame them, we are completely disempowered. So they open themselves up to love in this joyous life. And I thought, my God, I thought about my father and I thought, if I'm gonna blame him for all the bad, I need to blame him for all the good. His rejection, Gave what birth, gave what birth what inside of me to this yeah. hunger, this determination, this will, this drive to go achieve something that was completely impossible. His rejection was a gift. He was exactly the father I needed him to be, mm. to become the woman that I'm really proud to be today. Mm. So she taught me that. Mm. And she, you know, when we forgive, so I called my father, I, I, forgave him. I thanked him even for being that father that I needed him to be. And I had my father back. And he was there calling me every single day when I was sick. He calls me every single day. Still, forgiveness is for you, everybody. It is. Forgiveness is for you. It is. It will free you from the disempowerment of blame and it will set you free to live that life that you so deserve. Anyhow, the horses, sorry, I had to throw that in. I don't know where that came from. But anyways, when I realized what was happening to horses like Savannah, um, I actually saw a video of it happening. And when you see something like that, you can't you never forget it. And my wife and I knew that we, we had to do something. Did we have time in our lives for this? Absolutely not. We were both working like three jobs. But you find a way, right? You do. And since then, we've rescued 195 horses from slaughter. Oh. But the beautiful thing, for those of you that are like, oh, I don't like horses, I'll just check out for this bit. <laughs> horses heal humans. They do. So That's why they're what, equine therapy. Equine therapy, we run programs here at Believe Ranch and Rescue every single weekend for veterans with PTSD, people with addiction, people with depression, cancer survivors. 
but they heal humans. So here we are saving horses, but they're saving humans. So it's been just the ultimate gift to witness this. Eventually, we had to form our second nonprofit, Horses in Our Hands, which is lobbying in D.C. to get a federal ban on this practice altogether. Big animal groups have been trying to do this for 20 years. No one's gotten anywhere, but we actually have the bill. It's out of subcommittee. It's getting marking going to be marked up out of committee hopefully go through the house through the senate and we are praying this bill is going to be passed this year me and my wife so if you don't think you can make a difference <laughs> as one person or two people let me tell amazing. you amazing amazing like Siri, can possible. people can people help support it god please yes how please. tell us so you can either support Believe Ranch and Rescue, believeranchandrescue.org. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you can support us in saving the horses, giving them the care they need, and helping them heal humans. Or what we really need help with is the work that we're doing in D.C. It costs money. Not a lot of people want to donate money for lobbying we're putting all of our own funds, all the money we make, we're paying for it because this has to happen. Like in a sense, yes, you are supporting us and that's horses in our hands. Also mm -hmm. on Instagram, Facebook, every dollar helps. So after this, you and I are gonna have a chat because I have a friend in Washington and she might be able to help. So let's, let's visit that when this is done. She was also a podcast guest, so. No way. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah. That's they might go nowhere, but we'll try. We'll hey, try. we go down every single, you know. You lose nothing trying, right? Hey, the momentum is so great. We can actually smell the barn. And um, we feel very blessed to do the work that we do. And I thank you so much, Lindsay, for oh giving me the opportunity to talk about it. And anyone who's out here in Colorado, come by, come by Believe Ranch and Rescue, experience the magic of these horses. If you need healing, this is a place to come. Oh, I love that. So I want to know, one of the questions you asked me when I was a guest on your podcast is what is the legacy you want to leave? And that was a goosebump question for me. And I already see what you've left, but I want to hear from you. It's so important to me that it like, I, like it makes me so emotional because I know that I'm here still because this is what I'm meant to be doing. I know that that's why I'm still here. And it is, it's, it's touching lives. It's, it's healing. It's, it's not that I'm a healer. I'm not calling myself a healer, but it's like guiding people to live the life that you so deserve and guiding you to know that it's not outside of you, what you're looking for. It's all inside of you. And it's giving people a voice, their own voice where they can finally speak up for themselves, but giving animals a voice. Mm. And it's leaving this world a little bit better than it was when I got here. I want to make a difference. I want to make a beautiful difference. I want to give a voice to people, but I want every single human being and animal to live their best life, the life that you so deserve. I want you to be free of your pain. I want you to be free of your suffering. And I want you to understand that all your joy, all your triumph, everything that you need is inside of you right now. And that wasn't a concise answer, Lindsay. But oh my God, it was a perfect answer and I just have to tell you from one really big fan you're already doing all of those things and between the coaching the work with the horses your life experience and telling your story I mean this was a gift for all of us and there's so many things we didn't talk about <laughs> we didn't we get to, to do this well, I think we need a part two I, I really do I need a part two with you because I think you are absolutely magnificent I love what you're doing in the world you. what you do is so needed this is what shifts everything and you're just a beautiful human being and I thank you so much so I want more time with you. I'd love to come back and I want to thank yeah, everyone. We're going to do a part two. No question about it because we still have to talk about the book. We got to talk about the podcast. We got to talk about what services you offer. I mean, there's so many other good things and this just wasn't enough time. So there will be a part two. Yes, and uh, 
I am so, so glad you were here today. And I am just thrilled that you gave us that beautiful, beautiful story. I mean, all of them. And um, stay tuned for part two, everyone. Siri. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Big hugs. So much love. Thanks. All right. More to come, everyone. Stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks for listening to Heartbeat for Hire. If you like what you hear, I'd love it if you'd subscribe and leave a five-star review. To keep the conversation going, you can find me on Insta or at LinkedIn at Lindsay Dowd, H4H, or you can reach me at my website, heartbeatforhire.com. Thanks so much. Have a great day.